before I introduce uh, the, the next speaker, I wanted to talk a little bit about what IHS is and uh, why you guys should care about it. So uh, at IHS, our focus is on students, on uh, helping students get a deeper understanding about the Indians of Liberty, and also begin a career where you can actually make a difference for Liberty. So what we do is we offer uh, opportunities and resources for you to learn, get connected to other people, and, um, and make something of your career where you can advance Liberty. In particular, I want to focus on three different things that I think you should be aware of. Uh, one of which is Learn Liberty, which is our online uh, learning community about the ideas of liberty. Um, how many of you have seen a Learn Liberty video at some point? Okay, a few of you. Learn Liberty videos are short, three to four minute videos that present bite-sized pieces of uh, libertarian ideas in an easy way for you to both learn for yourself, find good ways to communicate those ideas to others, and share the videos. So I've heard of a lot of uh, people in the Students in Liberty Network who use the videos to start to kick off a student group, uh, to send it out to your members, or to you know, share it with your friends and, uh, and your uh, parents and relatives. Uh, so I, I definitely um, check out learnliberty.org if you're interested. Um, also, uh, I want to highlight our uh, in-person programs, specifically our summer seminars. If you really love these ideas and want to have a really intensive learning experience, Check out our week-long summer seminar, which we held on uh, college campuses uh, throughout the summer. It's a great way to meet other libertarians and really dive deep into some of the foundational ideas of Hayek, Friedman, Mises, and all, all those other guys. Uh, second of all are our paid internships. If you want to uh, get paid and actually uh, do something with these ideas, we have internships in public policy and journalism that you might want to check out. So all this, all the information about our programs is at our table over there, the green, uh, the green tabletop. Uh, you also should have a, a, car, a car on your chair. This is an image of uh, Baldy Harper, who's the founder of IHS. And on the back, there's a, a, a link and a, a QR code that, uh, where you can find out more about IHS uh, programs and opportunities. You can also uh, either talk to me uh, sometime for the rest of the day. I'll be here all day. Uh, we also have uh, Liz McCaffrey there in the back. Uh, Liz and I both work on Learn Liberty, that's kind of uh, our baby. I oversee the project and Liz is our lead video producer. So if you have questions about Learn Liberty or anything else that access related, come see us on time today. Uh, but without further ado, I'll uh, introduce our, our uh, IHS uh, sponsored speaker, uh, Professor Bob Taylor. Uh, professor Taylor is uh, a professor of political science at UC Davis, where he studies analytic, moral, and political philosophy and the history of liberal political thought. Specifically, his research is focused on uh, the relationship between liberalism and socialism and Hayek's critique of social justice. Uh, he's written a book called Reconstructing Rawls, The Kantian Foundations of Justice as Fairness, and as well as numerous uh, academic articles. Uh, and he'll be talking to us today about John Stuart Mill and the freedom of speech. So join me in welcoming Professor Bob Taylor. I've been for 25 years. I've done everything imaginable with them, you know, from the Liberty Society seminars to professional development self seminars. They're fantastic in providing support and in training you, and also providing you with sort of a, a different kind of scholarly experience than you might get at your university, right? So you'll have these seminars. If it, actually, how many of you have been to the Liberty Society? Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? So you're going to have academics there, academics like me, who will do academic talks, but you'll be introduced to thinkers, people like Hyatt, who sort of said John Stuart Mill, you wouldn't necessarily get a chance to learn about in your like, normal classes in college. Um, so again, highly recommend, uh, highly recommend the institution. I'm not going to, I hate standing behind a podium and stuff like that, so I'm just going to wander around and harangue you. Um, but let me know if I'm not talking loud enough to have trouble uh, hearing me, I'll talk, I'll talk louder. So what I want to talk about today is John Stuart Mill on free speech and his defense of free speech, but I have a more general point to make, and the general point can be summed up as follows. Um, if you don't know the grounds of what it is that you believe, then I don't think it's the case that you really know what you believe at all, and if you don't know what you believe, then you're not really going to be in a position to make the kinds of judgments you have to make when you face hard cases, that if you're not going to be in a position to take your beliefs and apply them in the cases where it matters. And John Stuart Mill is a good example of somebody who does that. So his defense of free speech is grounded in a certain kind of way. It's actually grounded on two values. One of those values is the value of truth. I think we all see the value of that. 
Another thing he grounded on that's maybe a little less obvious, a little less obvious as a value, is the, the value of development, specifically the development of particular kinds of human capacities, capacities for thought and capacities for action. And so what I'm going to show you is that, that kind of defense of free speech is, is uh, idiosyncratic in a way and leads to a particular kind of defense of free speech that has implications for these hard cases, hard cases like uh, hate speech laws, um, concerns with incitement to riot, um, you know, fighting words, etc. And some of these implications may be implications that you're not entirely comfortable with, and, and you can respond to that in a couple of different ways. And one way to respond to that is to say, I want a different kind of defense of free speech, one that will coincide with my considered judgments, right? And another kind of response might be, well, maybe I should realize, maybe I'm, you're attracted to the kind of defense of free speech he offers. In that case, you might say to yourself, maybe I should revise some of my considered judgments about these hard cases, right? But regardless of what you do, whether you take his views on board and revise your judgments, or you seek out some other kind of defense of free speech, that's going to be a growth proposition for you, right? Like to improve your own beliefs, and that's something Mill would definitely approve of. In fact, that's exactly why, or one of the reasons why, we're <coughs> speech to begin with. So let me start going. By the way, how many of you have read On Liberty at some point in your life? Ah, oh, that is, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a perfect kind of group to do this, <laughs> this talk in. When I do the talk, when I, I do a very similar talk at UC Davis, when I ask the same question, a much smaller number of hands uh, goes up. So what, what Mill offers us is basically four grounds for defending freedom of expression. And these things come in two pairs that relate to these grounds I was talking about just a second ago, right? So the first two arguments are arguments from truth, and the second two arguments are arguments from development. And what I'll do is he actually recaps these four grounds at the end of chapter two on liberty, and I'm going to march through them, talk just a little bit about them, and then go through them in more detail. And then I'll eventually show you how, in fact, it's based upon a certain kind of perfectionist political philosophy. And then I'll show you what kinds of implications I think it has in certain kinds of um, cases that are relevant to First Amendment jurisprudence. I'll bring up some Supreme Court cases as I go through it. So what's the first round? So the first round is just a quotation from the text. By the way, all the page references are to the John Gray um, edited uh, version of it's called On Liberty and Other Essays, Oxford University Press. It's a really nice collection. It's got utilitarianism on liberty, considerations on representative government, and on the subjection of women. I think it's important. So he says, if any opinion is compelled to silence, that opinion may, for all we can certainly know, be true. To deny this is to assume our own infallibility. So it may be the case that convinced other beliefs are just false. We can't, we can't know that they're not false for certain. Um, and if that's the case, if we try to take contrary opinions and silence them, we'll lose out, right? We'll continue to believe something that's false, and that's a horrifying proposition, or so he argues. But it's probably pretty rare that conventional beliefs have nothing to them, okay? In fact, what's more often to be the case is that the conventional truths that exist are partly true and partly false, and the things that challenge them are probably partly true and partly false. So he considers that, uh, that possibility in the second of his arguments, it says, though the silence opinion be an error, it may and very commonly does contain a portion of the truth. And since the general or prevailing opinion on any subject is rarely or never the whole truth, it's only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder of the truth has any chance of being supplied. So when he typically makes his argument in the first part of this chapter, I mean, the kinds of examples he gives, you know, as he talks about um, mistaken persecution, uh, people like Socrates and Jesus and Luther and so forth. I don't think it's the case anyway that the Mill thinks these people had the absolute truth. Well, their views are not even consistent with each other, so they couldn't all have been right, right? Um, so I don't think that's the case, but I think what he is arguing is they had a piece of the truth. They each of them had a piece of the truth. And that's the reason there was something wrong with suppressing their views. But both of these, uh, both of these arguments are, they have the same kind of quality. They both assume that received opinion is either wholly or partly false, right? And of course, many of the people who are making the claims for censorship, for suppressing particular kinds of views, they're just going to completely deny it. They're going to say, no, no, well, in many cases that might be true, but not in this case. In this case, the conventional truth is right. We know it for certain that it's right. Okay? But Mill's great. He doesn't stop there. In fact, that's not, I don't feel like these are not even his most interesting arguments. He has an entirely different pair of arguments he uses. And in these, he just 
takes for granted that the conventional viewpoint is true. It's like, that's fine. I'll grant that for the sake of argument. We still need open discussion. Why? Um, here, this is very interesting, I'm going to go into more detail on here in a second. So he says, even if the received opinion be not only true, but the whole truth, unless it is suffered to be and actually is vigorously and earnestly contested, it will, by most of those who conceive it, be held in the manner of prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling of its rational grounds. He sort of refers to this as, this, when, when beliefs become this way, they become a dead dogma. Right? They're a dead dogma in the sense that, well, first they're dogmatic. They're dogmatic in the sense that nobody understands, that people don't understand the foundations of those beliefs. Right? He's going to argue that in order to develop your capacity for thought, you're going to have to learn about the foundations of your beliefs and have them challenged. Okay? So that's key. So the idea of being rational grounds, replacing prejudice with knowledge, or as, as Plato might have it, he distinguishes between true opinion and knowledge. True opinion is being right not really having any idea why you're right. Knowledge is being right and knowing the foundation, the rational grounds for uh, why you're wrong. But it's not just this. It's not just developing capacity for thought. It's also something else. So he says, not only this, but the meaning of the doctrine itself will be in danger of being lost or enfeebled and deprived of its vital effect on character and conduct, the dogma becoming a mere formal profession, inefficacious for good, covering the ground, preventing the growth of any real heartfelt conviction, reason or personal experience. And so it's not just that you don't understand the ground, you don't really understand your own beliefs, it's those beliefs become hollowed out. And when they become hollowed out, they no longer move you. They no longer move you to change yourself, they no longer move you to change the world, right? That's the sense in which they're an encumbrance. They're an encumbrance to action in the world. So to develop capacity for action, you've also got to have your beliefs challenged. Again, these two are assuming but these conventional beliefs are true. Even if they're true, you need people constantly challenging them in order to develop these capacities. This is going to be an extremely important point when I talk about hate speech at the very end, right? I feel like these are the really powerful arguments when it comes to, uh, comes to hate speech. So let me start stepping through these. So ground one and two, I'm going to go over these very quickly because I feel like the case, the case here is fairly straightforward. So he certainly uses a you know, marshals a lot of historical evidence. He does it with rhetorical brilliance. It's a strong and engaging part of the text. Again, yeah, I've mentioned these examples of mistake and persecution here. Um, but in a way, that's the easy part, right? I mean, who in their right mind is going to claim to be infallible, right? I mean, even the Pope claims only infallibility with respect to doctrinal issues, right? Not overall infallibility. But very few people are even going to claim that. So given that, I mean, this is a strong case. It's obviously a very strong case. Are we absolutely 100% certain that conventional views are correct? Very few people are going to be willing to say, yes, I'm 100% certain. Um, and so this, but this is not peculiar, I don't think, to Mill's argument for freedom of speech. If you read um, John Wilson's Eric Gedeka, um, which is an argument against uh, what we would call prior restraint, licensing of publications by a censor before they can be published, his case hinges really strongly on the value of truth. If you value truth highly, you're always wanting to kind of challenge current beliefs, because those beliefs might be wrong, no matter how confident we are in them. I think the argument becomes a lot more interesting as already indicated, so if you spend legalese, you can argue in the alternative, right? It's not that he actually believes that conventional beliefs are true, but he says, I'll grant you that. Let's just pretend that they are completely true. Even in those cases, in fact, even more essential that um, the opposing views be able to be expressed. Okay. Um, now, why is that? Well, these next two grounds you indicate, as I've indicated, there's a difference between true opinion and knowledge, right? One thing is, it doesn't just matter what we believe, it matters how we believe it. That matters to the development of thought, certainly. And this is the beginning of this uh, subsection. An opinion that goes unchallenged is simply held as a dead dogma and not a living truth. Um, so the dead dogma is actually a nice, that phrase is really nice to remember or keep in your head. It's like a mnemonic device, right? It kind of keeps in your head these last two arguments he gives, both parts of it, right? What does a dogma mean? Well, to have something as a dogma is to hold it as a prejudice. It means to be unaware of its grounds, and that's what the third argument is going to be. Like, you've got to be aware of the grounds of your belief to even know what it is you're believing. The dead part is in relation to this fourth argument, unfazed by its meaning, 
right? It's dead in the sense that it doesn't move you to action. It lacks vitality. It's an idea that lacks vitality, okay? So let me sort of step through what he has to say about this third and fourth argument. So here's his third argument. He says, if the cultivation of the understanding consists in one thing more than any other, it is surely in learning the grounds of one of one's own opinions. Whatever people believe, they ought to be able to defend it against at least the common objections. I mean, I'm sure there's nothing more embarrassing than to believe something and have somebody offer up an objection and then you're just, you have nothing to say in response, right? Uh, but it's not just embarrassing. You know, I suggest something deeper here. It means you don't really, you don't even know what your beliefs are if you can't defend it against even the common objections. Or Bill goes on to say, this, is, this discipline is so essential to real understanding that if opponents of all important truths do not exist, we have to imagine them. We have to supply them up with the strongest arguments, which no skillful devil's advocate can conjure up. This is one of the greatest skills you can learn when you're writing papers, is anticipation of objections, right? How might somebody object to the kinds of claims I'm making? If you can really come up with good objections to your own argument, then you understand your argument, right? Really, only in that case. One of the nice things about being a political philosopher, or, well, some of the most frustrating things is most of the stuff I read, most of the stuff produced by my colleagues, it's on the left, like quite far to the left, you know, ranging all, as much variety as you can have, ranging from socialism to liberal egalitarianism, right? You know? And uh, that's fantastic, actually, from my point of view, because it forces me every day to grapple with viewpoints I do not agree with, the challenge of things that I think. That makes me a sharper thinker, and sometimes, I read the arguments and realize they're right and that I'm wrong, right? That's the other possibility is you actually change your viewpoint. That's why I also get up every morning, read the New York Times, and listen to NPR. As painful as that is, occasionally throw things at the radio when NPR comes on. So notice the emphasis on the cultivation of mental skills. Of, um, it's so much that so you have to imagine opponents, even these devil's advocates. This constant challenge is necessary. Why? It helps us grow as thinkers, right? It develops our cognitive capacities. And as you're going to see at the end, that's what it means in some sense to be a perfectionist thinker. It's a term of art of moral philosophy. It's the idea that there's something intrinsically valuable about human beings developing certain kinds of abilities they have. Those abilities could be intellectual in nature, they could be moral in nature, they could be emotional in qualities, like sympathetic capacities, right? They could be physical. All these capacities being developed, Mill is the sort of person who thinks this is not just good, it's something that's good in itself. If you know a lot of people, it's a strange comment, because he is ultimately a kind of hedonist, but he's, 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 somebody who's, he's somebody who's committed to hedonism in letter, but not in spirit. I think in spirit, he's, a, he's very much a perfectionist. This explains why he makes the kinds of arguments he does. How about four? The idea of being uh, the problem of being unfazed by the meaning of these beliefs. He says the fact, however, is that not only the grounds of opinion are forgotten in the absence of discussion, but too often the meaning of the opinion itself, the words which convey it cease to suggest ideas, or suggest only a small portion of those they were originally employed to communicate. Instead of a vivid conception of a living belief, right, a belief that moves you to action, there remain only a few phrases retained by rote, or if any part of the shell and husk only of the meaning is retained, the finer essence being lost. You know, if you've been in libertarian circles for as many years as I have, you know, you, you come across this, right? Somebody will quote you Rothbard, chapter and verse, but it is like chapter and verse is what it's like. It's kind of like a religious belief of the sort. His example actually is like the Lord's Prayer, like a religious ritual. Imagine just sort of saying this every day, day after day, until finally you're not even paying the slightest bit of attention to the words. It's just, it could just be meaningless souls coming out of your mouth, you're not thinking of the content of it. If you thought about the content of it, it might actually lead you to change your life and do something different, live differently, okay? But it's gone it's past that. It's just a husk, is all it is. Now, as you read on, though, it's not just, um, you, know, you slowly realize this concern for meaning, right, is actually a concern for vitality. I keep trying to bring that up, or what he calls the testing of opinion by personal experience. What bothers him about losing the meaning of your beliefs no longer provides a ground for action. So he provides a very sort of a, a, a stirring example, a very worrisome example. So he says to Christians, 
or many Christians anyway, whenever conduct is concerned, they look around for Mr. A and Mr. B to direct them how far to go in obeying Christ. So what does he mean by this? Well, you know, imagine somebody sitting in a church and the preacher's going on about the Gospels, and maybe he says, well, note where Jesus says, give up your property, give up your family, follow me, right? And you get to that point, and you imagine somebody sitting in the audience looking to Mr. A, looking to Mr. B, and say, oh, they haven't given up their Mercedes. They haven't given up their, their family. I guess I don't have to do it, right? Well, what's happened? You know, the Gospels have become just like a prayer that's repeated over and over again. It doesn't cause anybody to change their lives. It doesn't cause anybody to change what they do. It doesn't lead to action anymore. It's just something that's repeated by rote, right? It has no meaning. That's the horrifying thing. It's, like it's not like middle is necessarily a big fan of Christianity, but it disturbs him even to see this, to see people not live by the gospel that they supposedly claim to live by. That's disturbing to him, and it just becomes a shell or a husk. It doesn't motivate action. Three and four are very closely tied together. Opinions, atrophy, disuse, whether it's in thought or it's in action. A dead dogma. In other words, for some things up as an opinion whose lack of grounding prevents it from motivating behavior. Now, again, observe the connection between those grounds and Mill's perfections and imperfections, this idea that it's intrinsically valuable that you develop certain kinds of human capacities or abilities, moral, intellectual, physical, etc. And what this is all about, if you fail to challenge opinion, you hinder intellectual growth and you hinder the growth of our capacity and desire to carry the world into action. That's contrary to the tenets of perfectionism. So beneath all these arguments, even beneath really the concern for truth, is really a, a concern for the development of valuable human capacities. Again, only partly I think, ultimately about the pursuit of truth. So that gives you sort of a rough kind of thumbnail sketch of what his argument in favor of free speech looks like. Again, it has these two separate grounds, right? And that's kind of nice. It's nice to have robustness. Right? Maybe you, he's like, look, the way we think it should be for free speech is because of the value of truth and because of the value of development. Somebody might deny it for various reasons that truth is valuable. Well, you've still got the development argument, right? So overdetermination, I think, is useful in this case. And you'll see, actually, that when you apply this in particular cases, sometimes the truth argument is the one that does the job. Sometimes the development argument does the job. Sometimes neither does do the job. And it turns out that a certain kind of speech maybe can be regulated, maybe can be suppressed, right? And that's, I think, where Mill is at his most interesting. Where we, normally, if anybody thinks anything about Mill, right, he's like a great defender and apostle of liberty, and especially of freedom of speech. But there are points in his writings where he says it's acceptable to regulate speech or suppress speech. And I think those, that's where actually the theory is interesting. That's where you might want to either say to yourself, I think I need some other kind of defense of free speech. Or you may say to yourself, maybe I should change the particular views I have about these matters. So what I want to do now is just sort of step through some practical applications. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for discussion, so you can, uh, you can tell me what you think about these or maybe um, ask some questions about other kinds of applications. But the question you need to ask in all these cases, I think, from Mill's perspective, right, to see what the million case for either regulating or not regulating uh, these forms of speech are, is either truth or development or both promoted by allowing this kind of speech? And if the answer is no, then at least in the first instance, or at least in principle, there's not going to be a defense for protecting. I say at least first, or at least in principle, there might be other kinds of reasons for protecting this sort of speech. I'll talk a little bit about that as I go through. But just in the first instance, let's sort of think about can you offer a million sort of defense of protecting speech with regard to these things? Let's take in some sense the easiest one. Um, fighting words of various kinds. So think racial epithets, think curses, curses that actually mean somebody to the person you're cursing, right? Taking the Lord's name in vain to somebody who's a devout Christian. Uh, I think probably the one that's probably most striking is, you know, going up to a black person using the N word, right? I mean, there, that's going to probably, or in many cases, provoke a very powerful emotional response, potentially even violence in some circumstances, right? So what would Mill have to say about this? Um, I'm not sure. I can't, re can't recall if Mill speaks to this exact point, but he speaks to other points that are close enough to it that I'm pretty sure I know what his view on this would be. And that is, if I'll put some sort of step through it, um, what's the truth value of having people use these terms? 
It's a little hard to figure out exactly how it advances truth if somebody uses that N-word, right, in this context. Is that going to help clear the ground of false beliefs we might have? That somebody <coughs> might use a term like that? It's kind of hard to see. Maybe there's some sort of secondary or tertiary effects that have something to do with truth, but that's a little hard to hard to understand. Development? Well, that's almost a joke, right? It's extremely unlikely that uttering this is going to lead to any kind of cognitive development, any kind of capacity for action apart, you know, apart from the capacity to punch somebody in the nose, right? Um, so it's very hard to see that there's any kind of million argument for protecting these things. Now, as I said, there may be kinds of secondary arguments, right? And I'd say secondary arguments are of this sort, and this really doesn't have anything to do with what Mills argued so far. But you might say something like, well, but how do we know what fighting words are? So think about old uh, uh, George Allen, you know, the Senate candidate in Virginia. So four years ago, there's uh, somebody from his opponents, it was Chuck Robert, who was running against him four years ago. But Jim Webb. This is a Jim Webb, okay. There's somebody from Jim Webb's campaign sends a campaign worker to videotape him. And then he's on stage, and at some point he's like, makes a reference to this guy and refers to him as macaca, I believe, was the term. And of course, I think if I were the guy, the immediate response would have been, well, I don't know what the hell that means, but it doesn't sound good, right? Because I mean, this is not a sort of standard racial epithet. In fact, if you go online and sort of look at the genealogy of this, it's really hard to tell exactly what the origins of it are and why Alan would have thought to use it. There's some speculation about the time his family spent in North Africa or what have you, right? But hard to parse out. But in that case, I mean, does that count as a fighting word? I mean, my guess is the person it was used with respect to probably didn't take it as a fighting word, although he probably thought it must be offensive in some way to have been used in it like that, right? Is that the sort of thing that should be punished then, right? Or should that be protected speech? Um, you know, I think back to a case in, when I was in college where uh, a group of black students on a university campus, I can't remember where it is now, they passed or passed into the, the window of a dorm room and somebody shouted out at them, water bubble. Is that, a, is that a racial epithet? Or it's like unclear exactly what it is or what category it falls into, right? Now the reason I bring that up is, is if you do try to fail to protect fighting words on the kind of argument I've made, right? It's like, well, it's not clear that there's any kind of million defense in protecting that kind of speech. The problem is, it's hard sometimes to tell what's a fighting word and what's not a fighting word. If that's true, it may lead to a chilling effect, right? We call this sort of a secondary effect. Then people will always be asking themselves, wait a minute, is the word I'm about to use fighting word or not, that is, will I be punished for saying it or not? And that could be problematic, right? That kind of chilling effect could be problematic. But let's say we have, you know, let's say we have a device, right, like this device, and I can hold it up to my mouth as I say a word, or maybe it's a think a word, right, put it up to my head, and then I can look at it and it goes fighting word, or not fighting word, right? <laughs> Suppose you had a device like that? If you did, then I think it would be the case that Mill would say, okay, then it's no problem. There is no defense for uttering those kinds of words. That is, they shouldn't get any kind of Right? But there is no such device, so that does lead you to wonder whether you know, there's a really clean answer. But again, in the first instance, in principle at least, I don't see why Mill's arguments would defend um, that or protect that kind of speech. The Supreme Court case is probably most relevant is uh, Chaplinsky. We have like a Jehovah's Witness who's preaching, and some cop stops him from preaching. Um, I don't know if he's going to arrest him for preaching, but he just stops him from preaching, and so the guy looks at the cop and says, you're a damn fascist. And you know, the cop then arrests him, right? <laughs> takes him to jail. And the Supreme Court basically made a million kind of hard response. They're like, well, that's just not protected speech. And it's not protected speech because it's not discussion of an idea. It's just a term of abuse, right? And it's only discussions of ideas that we should be um, protecting. So I think the, the Supreme Court often is arguing some sort of first American, first American jurisprudence are often sort of disturbingly billion, um, and their reasoning is often quite billion. How about falsely shouting fire in a crowd of gators? This is a famous one from, um, you know, from Shank. Uh, this Holmes uh, uses this example. Well, again, well, this one may be slightly more complicated. If, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming here that it's false, right? So it's not clear really how it advances the truth. It's the fact that it advances falsehood, presumably. It's also not clear how it's going to lead to any kind of development, again, apart from the development of your muscles and you know, sprinting towards the exit or something. So if that's the case, again, unclear. Although, I do sort of emphasize it falsely, though. I mean, surely it's the case.
case that we don't want people to be too hesitant when it comes to, you know, if I see somebody in a theater, like, you know, light up a cigarette, which may be against the rules, I might think there's a fire, and I might yell out, fire. You probably don't want to punish somebody in that instance if they make an honest mistake. So, presumably, there would have to be some indication that uh, it's been done for mischievous purposes, right? Um, uh, these are going to get more complicated or even more controversial as I go along. Sorry for the easy ones. So, how about incitement to riot? So, the example that Mill uses in On Liberty is the idea of somebody standing in front of an angry mob, and a mob that's angry about corn dealers, you know, corn dealers who are hoarding corn, driving up prices, starving poor children, right? And so he says, is it okay even to give um, a speech, a fairly reasoned speech, like an argument of some kind, in front of the home of a corn dealer, where you make the argument that corn dealers are starvers of poor children, right? And you're making this argument to an angry mob, maybe a, a mob of men whose children are starving, right, as a result of the action of the corn dealer. Um, you know, is that okay? And Mill himself says no. And I think it's important to understand why he said it's okay to regulate that kind of speech. I think he thinks it's okay to regulate it because, actually, of these two things, right? Now, if somebody had made that speech, put it in writing, and somebody was reading it calmly in their own study or something like this, or somebody was giving a speech like that on a college campus far from the corn dealer's home, then being in a very different context might make um, that speech protected speech on Mill's understanding. Why is that? Well, it's more likely that there, there might be some kind of truth value. People would actually be paying attention to the content of the argument, right? And that, that content might be challenging things that they think. Maybe they grow as a result of it. There may be a development kind of aspect to it. But the problem with the, ca the case that I brought up, right, is one where it's not likely that people are going to be thinking too much about the truth of the claims that are being made, nor is there going to be any kind of intellectual development. In fact, the idea of inciting somebody to riot is an attempt to short circuit people's cognitive capacities, right? It's to hit buttons so they act like animals, like an attack dog, where you yell out a word and they attack. It's actually closer to the fighting words example, right? Where you get these kinds of automatic responses. And that's the reason why they, they sort of the the Supreme Court case that most interest is Brandenburg, Brandenburg versus Ohio, and it says, it sets actually a fairly high standard for um, whether you can suppress speech that's likely to cause a riot. It basically says, well, is it likely that the speech will cause a riot? It says, well, if it's likely, is it also imminent, right? That something's going to happen almost right now, and the case that Mill uses has those qualities. You've got a bunch of angry people, so it's likely you can stir them up. It's also imminent in the sense that if they get angry enough to want to kill a corn dealer, well, hey, there's one right next to them, right? And so the cops are going to have a really hard time stepping in and doing anything about it. So in those cases, it doesn't, at least in specific circumstances, right, where violence is likely, violence is imminent, it doesn't look like the kinds of justifications you usually get for speech <coughs> are going to hold. Um, now let me just sort of talk about who he doesn't really deal with much, where I think there really is a kind of million defense for these certain aspects of these kinds of speech. So take defamation. Now it's probably going to be pretty hard to make a million case for protecting defamation against private persons. Um, you know, imagine you know you telling, deciding to go tell everybody in the neighborhood that your neighbor enjoys you know cross dressing when nobody's at home or something. And this is just a private person minding their own business doing this, right? So if you've invaded privacy and you've defamed them, even though, let's just say, let's say it's a lie, that person actually doesn't do that. So you're, it's actually a libel against this person to say this. And you're also going to say probably, well, it's certainly unclear how it has anything to do with development. You're just providing a fact or a supposed fact. It's, why would that develop anybody's mental capacities to know that your neighbor's cross-dressing? Um, and is it a truth? Well, you know, by assumption, it's not true here, but even if it were true, is it the kind of truth that we particularly value? Is it the kind of thing we really want or need to know about? Probably not. But take public figures, right? This issue of defamation against public figures. I mean, this distinction between private and public figures and the kind of standards you have to use for defamation as a whole. This is a famous Supreme Court case, New York Times versus Sullivan, that set the standard of actual malice. So if a um, public figure, especially a political leader, let's say, claims that he's been defamed and libel in some way, seditious libel, right? Um, then it has to be the case that there's been actual malice, that is a reckless, 
disregard for the truth. And why do they set the bar that high? That's a really hard case for a prosecutor to make, um, that there's, you know, there's a reckless disregard for the truth. Well, presumably it's because, um, not I think because of the development aspects of it, again, just to learn that your congressman took $40,000 across the desk. It's just not clear, again, what the cognitive development is. It's not an argument, it's just a presentation of a fact. But that truth matters a lot. We know politicians, we know leaders are in a position, they have access to power, right? And they're liable to be corrupted as a consequence. And in a democracy, or in any kind of government, you have to be concerned about that kind of corruption and what it leads to. As a consequence, you really value the truth highly, and so you want to encourage people as much as possible to reveal forms of corruption, right? So because of that, you're going to set the bar for defamation extremely high. You've really got to show that the person is just literally out to get the person in question. Really doesn't even care about the truth. Just wants to bring down the person. Right? And again, I don't think that much to do with the development. I think that's to do with the importance of truth in these circumstances. Knowing whether our officials are corrupt or abusing power is so important that you set the bar for prosecution uh, very high. And then on the flip side, I want to bring in hate speech, which I'm going to distinguish from fighting words, right? So this is in the form of an argument. Here it's going to be the opposite. I don't, some of the truth value that strikes me is really at stake. It's more the value of development. So I'll define hate speech in a particular way, right? I'm going to understand it as a kind of rude libel. So let's, let's think of it as speech, spoken or written, that argues, right? It's a presentation of an argument of some kind. The premises, empirical evidence, conclusion, the usual things that you get in an argument for the mental, physical, or ethical inferiority of members of certain historically oppressed groups, blacks, women, Jews, gays, etc. So think about something, I mean, think about something like you know, protocols of the elders of Zion to the huge anti-Semitic garbage. But it's a, it's a book, right, that Henry Ford was quite fond of and helped to, you know, basically finance the distribution of, that made sort of kind of usual nonsensical claims about Jews, the blood libel, the idea that Christian children and drain their blood and using it for ceremonies. I mean, you can go, what's amazing is you can go find this stuff readily in bookstores, often in the Middle East and Russia uh, and so forth. But at least it, there's some kind of argument involved. There's a marshalling of evidence. It's in a written form, right? It doesn't necessarily fall into sort of the incitement to riot circumstances. People are often reading something like that in privacy of their own homes. Um, it doesn't necessarily have fighting words quality to it. It's not going to short circuit people's cognitive capacities. I think there's a pretty strong case for the protection of this kind of speech on development grounds. I don't think so much on truth grounds. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have much faith in any, anything like this is actually true. So I don't think the value of it is, well, gosh, in time we may find that this in fact is true. That our conventional beliefs about equality uh, you know, across races or across genders is wrong. But that's actually why Mill's arguments are so important, the structure of them is so important. I think the, the strong case to be made for protecting hate speech is on development grounds. We want people to challenge our commitment to racial and gender equality. And why do we want them to challenge it? For the exact reasons that Mill talks about. If we do not challenge it, then we'll start holding these things as a dead dogma. A dogma in the sense we don't know the grounds of it, and dead in the sense it doesn't move us to take any action. Certainly when we're confronted with hate speech, we often want to take action, take political action, speak back in response. That's the thing that keeps belief viable, um, that kind of So that's, I think, the argument for protecting it, and it's more on development grounds. So hate speech, I think, on development grounds, defamation, uh, on grounds of truth, at least in regards to the public figures. So again, what have I basically done? I sort of cashed out sort of Mill's full argument for freedom of speech, right? So, you know, you've got, you know, you've got a claim about freedom of speech, but it has certain limits. Why does it have the limits that it has? Because of the way he grounds the argument, because he grounds it on truth and development. And that allows or puts him in a position, puts us in a position, actually, to make some calls in hard cases, right? Difficult cases. And again, you may look at those cases, especially if you're of a libertarian persuasion, sort of free speech absolutist, to look at that and go, no, it's just all of them. <laughs> it's like all of these things should be allowed all the time. Of course, then the question is, how would you defend that point, right? How would you ground those kinds of claims about speech? Um, I'm happy to talk about that uh, in Q&A. Um, or you might just come to the conclusion that maybe if you had other beliefs about these things, maybe you'd prefer to revise those judgments. Um, but again, 
either way, you've learned something about your beliefs, you've come to a better grounding of them, you've understood a bit more about how they're, they're to be applied. So, thank you.